Okay, good evening everyone. I hope you can all hear me. This is Trolley with Logic and it's a very kind of rushed, um, slapped together episode. We've had so many problems getting tonight's guest on. Uh, the original time it was the technical problems and just before we went on here the technical problems have reappeared. So hopefully we can hold out long enough to give you a good show. Uh, just to let everyone know, you can ask your questions anytime in the chat room and you can call in, as you can see, the Skype contact is thrown in with logic. And like I say, if you call in, please remember you grant us permission to use your likeness because the show is later uploaded on iTunes and YouTube. As like I say, it's a reduced crew today. Um, welcoming back, Sheila. How are you doing? Hey, Cal. I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. All right, and so we'll very quickly introduce the guest. If you've been watching the show for a while, he'll be quite familiar to you. He is, I think he's, the, I don't know if he's the former or he's still the secretary of the Scottish Secular Society. He was also a... Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, and a journalist for Gay Star News, if I remember correctly. Uh, Scott Scott's gay. Scott's gay, yeah. I, was, yeah, I get those two years. Weeks, so. Ten years stint. Yeah. Oh. Okay, and also he wrote the book Sexual Fascism. Um, I can't remember the publication date. And Examining the treatment of the sex in the Scottish media. Okay, and his most recent book, which is just released, is it tomorrow? It's really officially released, Gary. Uh, that's the launch, yeah. I've, yeah. I've did it privately on Facebook and stuff with... Uh, my friends on Scottish Secular Society, and it's religious fascism, yeah. and it's the repeal of Section 28, which, I hope you'll give me a moment to talk about on air, providing yes. we don't crash. And yes, <laughs> as long as everything <laughs> holds up. So, yeah, Paris please welcome. Flying. So, everyone, please welcome uh, Gary Oton. It's great to have you back on, and like I say, I am really sorry about the delays in getting this show and the problems we've had. Okay, thanks, Cal. Uh, thanks, Sheila. Um, so, right. I, some I suppose. Um, little, no, sorry. Yeah, sorry. If, if you just said, right. So your new book is religious fascism, the repeal of Section Twenty Eight, and I think probably for some of our viewers and listeners, the best thing I think would be what exactly was or is Section Twenty Eight. Right. Okay. Well, I mean, some will see the imposition of Section 28, which was the law that forbade the quote-unquote promotion of homosexuality as a pretended family relationship um, against the backdrop of Margaret Thatcher addressing a sea of waving Union Jacks at the Conservative Party conference um, 1987. Um, following hot on the heels, of course, of exaggerated tabloid stories of black lesbian self-defense groups or books like Jenny Lives with Erica Martin, uh, Susan Bursch's book, which was found in school libraries. Um, actually, it was found in a teacher's resources library. Um, accompanying this law's passage in 1988, um, a firebomb went off at the offices of London's gay newspaper, Capital Gay. Um, if I remember correctly, far from condemning, condemning the action, Tory MP Dame Elaine Kellett Bowman um, stood up in the House of Commons to voice her contempt for gay sex and declared that it was right that there should be an intolerance of evil. Um, what followed soon after that was a dramatic increase of attacks on gay men and another bombing of a gay bar in Rochester with tear gas. Um, now, when this Tory, anti-gay, religiously inspired law was challenged in 2000, Scotland was the main battleground. Um, in England and Wales, efforts to keep Section 28 on the statute books was to a large extent pretty pointless since section 28 applied not to schools but local authorities whose control many had opted out of under me measures introduced by of all people former Tory leader Margaret Thatcher so <laughs> bit of a waste of time there but the Scots will remember the repeal as a time when the gay community were under attack from 
uh, billboards mounted across every available space in Scotland, vilifying homosexual practices. Um, intellectuals who wrote newspapers to lend support were denounced. Newspapers spread warnings of cliques, uh, rumours of an international conspiracy, and attempts were made to close LGBT organisations, and doors and windows of such premises were smashed. Um, pictures could even be found in newspapers at the time, illustrating a homosexuals' distinguishing features, you know, the, 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 the fingers. Um, Parliament wavered and buckled while the community in crisis was left to defend itself against a rise in verbal abuse, beatings, suicide, murders. Uh, this was not Germany in 1935. This was Scotland in 2000. And it was simply sparked when MSP Wendy Alexandra announced the repeal of Section 28 and Christian fundamentalist Brian Souter poured two, approximately £2 million into a Keep the Clause campaign, which was backed by Cardinal Winning of the Catholic Church and a string of social conservatives. Now, it began in 1999 when controversial American TV evangelist Pat Robertson, owner of a mammoth media educational and legal empire in the USA with an estimated value of billion, a billion dollars. I mean, we're talking big. There's big money for the Bank of Scotland. D forget, you know, having customers in Scotland filling the coffers of the Bank of Scotland. This was a biggie. This was bigger than having, you know, the, the, the population of Scotland on board. Um, he, Pat Robinson was introduced to ultra-conservative Catholic Bill Hendry of the Bank, the Bank of Scotland's executive vice president in the USA. And the bank announced, soon after, the bank announced it was setting up a telebanking operation with Pat Robertson, who once claimed that, and I'm quoting now from, from his, the feminist agenda is not about equal rights for women. It's about a socialist anti-family political movement that encourages women to leave their husbands, kill their children, practice witchcraft, destroy capitalism and become lesbians. So uh, you only have to Google mm -hmm. Pat Robertson to get plenty of classic idiotic statements like that and better. Um, but the bank announced it was setting up um, the, the, tele, the, the, the telebanking operation with him and as bank of scotland share prices fell and clients started withdrawing their savings the bank was forced to pull out that was when robertson labeled scotland a darker place a dark place overrun by homosexuals the bank bank of scotland called on media boss and ex-son editor jack irvin he was also a drummer in the um, band uh, B.A. Robertson, if you remember that, yeah. um, to, to step in and help. And during the, e he, it was during the equally contentious debate about an equal age of consent, Irvin was famous for referring to pretty young boys of 16 who couldn't vote being mature enough to be bum chums for sleazy old pervs. So you get an idea where Jack Irvin was coming from. Scotland's richest man, stagecoach boss Brian Souter, a Bank of Scotland customer, a member of the Hellfire and Brimstone Church of Nazarene, was sufficiently inspired by Irvin to call him for an idea of his own. Um, they shared a good lawyer, um, Jack Irvin's business partner, Peter Watson, sometimes accompanied him on, accompanied him on business uh, trips to the Cayman Islands. Um, he was the man behind legal firm Levi and McRae, which legaled articles for the press, so pretty influential. Um, and as Scotland's top lawyer, Watson counted the Lord Advocate of Scotland, um, Elish um, Angelini, uh, an appointed member of the Scottish Government as one of his most prestigious clients. Um, so big names here. Um, powerful figures backed this new 
Keep the Claws campaign, not just Martin Clark, the editor of Scotland's top-selling tabloid, The Daily Record, but also the editor of The Sun, uh, the Scottish editions of The Sun, uh, Scotland on Sunday, The Daily Mail, of course, uh, The Daily Telegraph, of course, and numerous other publications. Um, given the surfeit of Christian journalists and columnists in the media, uh, in Scotland and, and both the Westminster and Scottish executive, there was no short shortage of, of allies to respond to this emerging Christian campaign. Um, under the auspices of preventing the repeal of Section 20, uh, of Clause 28, uh, Section 22A it was called in Scotland, gays were made scapegoats for a war against the siren voices of liberalism secularism and permissiveness, um, education packs that either sought to counter bullying by creating a better understanding of gay people or sex education leaflets aimed specifically at gay people to encourage safer sex were put under scrutiny. Um, all the while the media perniciously portrayed homosexuals as sinister menace with inferences of a homosexual lobby seeking to prey on impressionable youth uh, and further a selfish agenda. Homosexuals were maligned in a media campaign furnished by, you know, well-funded Christian charities and organisations, some collecting around two million a year in annual income, uh, like the Christian Institute and Christian Action Research and Education, which, you know, plants interns in government and media. And Scotland's fledgling parliament would twist and turn as one compromise after another was offered to placate the pious. Pleas for equal treatment were contorted into demands for additional rights. For example, um, a, vic a victim of the Soho pub bombing was denied compensation under the Criminal Injuries Compensation Act after sustaining injuries um, and, and losing his partner, whilst the partner of a heterosexual couple won theirs. And then when Martin Fitzpatrick, who fought successfully against eviction from a house he shared with his partner after he died, former religious correspondent and Daily Record columnist Tom Brown wrote, what worries me is that this is, will be taken as capitulation to the homosexual cause the signal to demand more. So we're always wanting more. We, gay people have always fought for equality, not more. Never mind. SNP MP Jim Sillers at the time was writing in the Scottish Sun, he had his own column there, and he sneered that test tube births on a scale of millions with the sperm of homosexuals conveyed artificially to women's ovaries in order to give homosexuals full rights to have children. And that test tube world is the only logical conclusion of the Thatcherite campaign of full and equal rights. So, you know, we were consistently smeared everywhere. And my long-term favorite is uh, Gerald Warner. And he wrote in Scotland on Sunday, a Catholic columnist, and he wrote that homofascism was aggressively and shamelessly the ideology of the parliament and that homosexual missionaries were coming for their children and incited people to take to the streets in protest. Um, he used to mock at the lisp of the Labour MSP, Wendy Alexandra, who was, who was putting this through parliament. He kept calling her in his columns the Minister for Communities. Um, who, and uh, she, she fronted the campaign for repeal and, and he also suggested she was living testimony, testimony to the unwisdom of abolishing the ducking stool. Um, any equal treatment of gays was fair game. Gerald Warner's homophobia, it knows no bounds now or then. On gay partnerships, um, I remember he scoffed, there, there is a vote winner for you, possibly with the cooperation of sympathetic local authorities, provision could be made for the romantically minded to hold their wedding at the public convenience where the happy couple first met.
very nice special letters pages of letters in the newspapers were rolled out uh, against repeal and they froth with homophobia um, this is one from John McBride of Shettleston who wrote in the Scottish Sun I don't have any kids myself but if I did and anyone tried to teach them about homosexuality I'd probably end up assaulting the teacher in the Metro, which is owned, uh, owned by the same publisher as the Daily Mail, nine out of the ten letter writers in the London edition were found to share the same names or initials as those in the Scottish editions, even though they wrote the, what they wrote about was completely unrelated. Anyway, moving on. Cardinal Winning was soon declaring gay sex a perversion. And what inspired my cover, which on the face of it, you think, whoa, really strident here. You know, the Christian Nazi mm. symbol, the flags that the Christian Nazis used to fly uh, with religious fascism. But it was inspired by Cardinal Winning, who declared gay sex a perversion. And on a trip to Malta, compared the gay lobby's imagined distribution of material in schools to Nazi bombs during the Second World War. Upon his return from Malta, he was met with press reports of a serious attack on a young doctor outside an Edinburgh gay bar. Threats of suicide to the gay switchboard at that time doubled. Yeah. When a string of professors and academics wrote to the press sharing their concerns, they were mocked by the Keep the Clause camp. Um, Journalists regularly attacked Labour politicians who supported repeal. Um, people like Donald Gere's advisor, Philip Chalmers, was caught with a lady who was not his wife, although she may have been somebody else's, um, in, in the back seat of his car in a red light, a red light area after the record was tipped off by the police. Um, Donald Dewar's chief of staff, John Rafferty, was also targeted when he exaggerated death threats to Health Minister Susan Deacon over her support for abortion. Um, but the chief target was always Wendy Alexandra, described um, in the record as bossy, um, a spinster, um, five foot nothing, and showered by a host of other uncharitable and misogynistic remarks. I mean, they suggested she was um, riding high in the riding high in the department of Frump, uh, and gave her a makeover. This is with the Daily Record. They gave her a makeover, superimposing a head onto the body of a woman curled up on a couch, wearing a white trouser suit with lilac strapped shoes. Ugh. <laughs> Alan Cochran, in Scottish editions of the Daily Telegraph, called her the accident-prone and politically myopic Miss Alexander. Um, Channel 4 awarded Wendy Alexander a trophy and the title Parliamentarian of the Year in Scotland. Um, but the press were delighted to report how she smashed it to pieces as she got out of a car at Heathrow Airport. And the following year, Channel 4 awarded it to Christian homophobe Baroness Young. Yeah. <laughs> oh. I need iron. Um, so, um, <coughs> iron brew. Uh, Bars told me to show that during the programme. <laughs> <laughs> Joseph, just kidding. Most of the press um, accepted paid advertising of Keep the Clause yeah. petitions to complete and send to the government. Many were backed by articles or even marked to indicate exactly where to sign to keep Section 28 um, or Section 2A as it was known in Scotland. And churches too followed, urging their congregations to sign. Um, a free mailing address was set up to collect thousands of signed petitions and the Scottish Sun found Condoms sent by gay rights activists fighting to scrap Clause 28, um, whilst the record reported the delivery of old beds and refrigerators. <laughs> and I actually remember an email some time ago, someone told me that they'd sent a car. I don't know how true that was, but someone would have to confirm that. But anyway, Brian Souter threatened to launch a private referendum. This was big. Um, 
he castigated the electoral electoral reform society ERS for refusing to back it so using an old electoral register he launched his own after accusing a gay clique in the labor administration of wrecking his plans um mp Jimmy Ray referred to a gay mafia in the Scottish Sun. Uh, she's a big tabloid. And in The Scotsman, he advised people didn't vote Labour into power to allow the country to be run by a gay mafia. The public don't want to know what homosexuals are doing. This is the trendy minority trying to dictate to the majority, and it won't work. I mean, here you see echoing the Nazi treatment of Jews in the 30s, when there were references to powerful Jewish cliques influencing government and of Jewish trickery. Um, the Scottish Sun referred openly to gay, dirty tricks. And the record warned, the Section 28 turmoil has gone from unsatisfactory to downright sinister. And it's now clear that powerful factions are determined that the people of Scotland will not have their say. And this was also aimed at ERS member and gay Labour MP Stephen Twigg. The ERS was in fact concerned about the rise in violence towards gays being reported by the police. Keep the Clause had already become a playground catchphrase and police set up a special surgery in Edinburgh the Daily Mail printed a double page spread with an anatomical diagram of the human phalanges explaining homosexual men have slightly shorter second fingers than straight men. Uh, and the record also carried the information along with the homophobic content. Um, in a film review for American Beauty, uh, the da Daily Mail details how Hollywood was demonizing heterosexual life as part of a disturbing new pro-gay agenda. And this held that heterosexuality was a curse to be denigrated and mocked wherever possible, and that gays could never win the power they craved in society without undermining heterosexuals whenever possible. Three quarters of those surveyed by the Gay Police Association cited belief of perpetrator as a prime motivator behind homophobic incidents. Um, their advertisement showing a Bible and a pool of blood with the words in the name of the Father was censored by the Advertising Standards Authority. Despite coming, but despite coming eighth in a list of campaigns receiving the most complaints, keep the clause billboards were never removed despite widespread deface defacements from protesters all across Scotland. Um, Outcast, the gay political website, was closed. According to the internet survey, uh, internet um, service provider, following a complaint, a university lecturer was paid almost a quarter of a million pounds in damages and legal costs by the ISP Demon, which is owned by Scottish Telecom, in an out-of-court settlement over material carried on the site. Outcast was a respected and nationally distributed gay political magazine run by volunteers with a circulation of around 10,000. It boasted contributions from many people who were sympathetic to gay equality. And the ISP net benefit wanted an assurance from a solicitor acting for outcast that they would not print anything libelous. Obviously, no solicitor can give a guarantee like that. Um, and that was repeated by Chris Morris, who had previously taken Britain to the European Court over its unequal age of consent. Um, then a Christian couple, backed by Christian legal representatives, sought to take Glasgow City Council to court for promoting homosexuality. Um, they eventually withdrew, but succeeded in persuading the council to write to all council-funded LGBT groups, warning them not to promote homosexuality. 
And of course, the media spun this as a victory. As the ca campaign to repeal went nationwide, there was a surge of violence and murders, um, particularly gay men across the whole country, like 50-year-old Alex Noble, who met his fate after picking up an 18-year-old in Glasgow, and Ethan, um, a sensitive boy who was being bullied in a Catholic comprehensive in the Highlands, they would have taught him, you know, that it was in, he was intrinsically disordered. He wrote in his diaries how he was being bullied. I mean, the, the guy was 16. He hung himself. He went to his room and hung himself. The, the fledgling parliament shook and wobbled at every turn towards repeal. At first, ministers said that the guidelines on sex education were adequate and would not be reviewed. Then they were. Despite insisting there'd be no replacement clause for Section TA, the Scottish executive was soon tabling one. Ministers insisted the guidelines on sex education would not uh, be made legally binding. Mm. Then came a U-turn. The public were assured by the then First Minister, Donald Gere, that there would be no inclusion of marriage in any guidelines. But with an amendment by a Catholic MSP, Michael McMahon, religious campaigners were soon trying their luck with that one too. There was nothing, that was nothing compared to the semantic contortions that Scotland went through over sex education. I mean, without national a national curriculum, as in England and Wales, Scotland has no need for statutory guidelines. There were no calls for teachers for statutory guidance on drugs or alcohol where teachers were trusted. Now there were calls for statutory guidelines on sex education. The Minister for Children and Education at that time was Sam Galbraith, and he emphasised that these were not guidelines which would govern the content of statutory legislation, always rebuffed as contrary, contrary to Scottish pra practice, but guidance which govern the conduct of sex education in Scotland. And this, this was just guidance to state that parents had to be consulted if sex education appropriate to pupils' ages was given to their children, and that they could even remove them from classes, although that right already existed. Okay, Section 28 was eventually repealed and stories of schools invaded by homosexual propaganda proved entirely false. <laughs> the same couldn't be said for religion, which, if it didn't already own the school, had their unelected representatives on all of Scotland's education committees. If school children couldn't be rounded up to visit churches, clerics were invited into the classroom to work with children in so-called non-denominational schools without parents' consent and knowledge, which happened at Kirkton Holm Primary School in East Kilbride, where extreme sect Church of Christ had been pushing creationist anti-science literature on children for eight years before they were rumbled by the Scottish Secular Society and the Daily Record, albeit under a new editor. So, finishing up, should we burn <laughs> down all the churches? No, we shouldn't. We shouldn't burn the churches and we never will rid the world of mysticism, spirituality, religion or belief, even if we tried. However, we can ensure no church is awarded special privileges that operates equally and fairly in society. We can invest in a secular society with freedom of religion and freedom from it. And by doing so, we will hopefully prevent the polarizing of the religious debate that contributes to wars, division, loss of human life and religious fascism. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gary. Thank you very much, Gary. Uh, one question uh, one I wanted to ask was, to ask was well, I'm echoing badly from you, Gary. That's better. Are now. you? Yeah, it's All right. it's gotten better yeah. now. Um, I was going to ask was how much do you think um, the whole Section Twenty Eight carry on? Did you think that held back gay rights in Scotland? Um, uh, yes, I mean there are so many things that 
hold the progression of gay of gay, of gay rights. Um, you've got, I mean, you've got independence at the moment. Nobody's really finding it easy to 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 challenge the government in these difficult times. And also, of course, when Section Twenty Eight was being debated, um, there there could. I mean, everything was focused on Section 28, as everything was focused on the equal age of consent before it. And nothing could move forward. Nothing could move forward at all. We wanted to, you know, gay people wanted to move on and create a climate of equality, which could have been done many years ago. It could have been done in the 60s. Just simply create a new law. Instead of all these little bolt-ons, yeah. all the time that with these extraordinary bolt-ons. I mean, Section 28 was a very complicated affair. Um, it was an amendment to the Local Government Act of 1986, and enact it was in enacted by the um, uh, it, 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 it was enacted by the Local Government Act in 1988, that's it. And uh, it was hatched from a Department of Education and Science circular um, saying that there's no place in, in the school under any circumstances for teaching which advocates homosexual behavior almost as if you know as, as an as a norm almost as if you know this is something that can be promoted i mean you either or you you either are or you aren't or you either participate in gay sex or you don't it's not something that really can be promoted um extraordinary but you have all these kind of <sighs> old farts in the House of Lords and in the Tory party that were just churning out a lot of rubbish. I mean, since that time, much of the Tory party who were involved in that campaign have since apologised for their behaviour and for not supporting repeal. Yeah. So we've moved on. Yeah. And have the apologies been met well by the gay community? Have they been accepted? Uh, do gay people vote Tory? Um. <laughs> <laughs> no, but just in general, has the you know the, have the you know apologies just been welcomed and accepted at the very least? Yes, I think I, I think amongst gay organizations of course the yeah. any apologies are going to be gratefully accepted we we really do have to move on um but my concerns are always you know what was it all about in the first place right. and you know i i i, I feel that it, it starts it's a cultural thing it starts in the schools we have to educate people better yeah. um and we are a long way off that I mean, only recently, I think it was last year, the British Humanist Association uh, were doing some research and they found some 40 or 50 schools um, actually introducing Section 28 style um, proposals in, in their conditions of the school. So, you know, the... the, the the government have had to clamp down on that, but the fact that they were being introduced is very worrying. And that's not only where it's in being introduced, it is being rolled out across the world. And that's the point of my book. And that's um, the very sad note that this book ends on, is how it's being <clears throat> introduced to Russia. And it's really quite criminal what what it what is happening there where gangs marauding gangs are just like that young i think it was a young doctor who was beaten up outside the gay pub you know he said in the paper after he was in hospital you know these gangs of kids who did this will be endorsed by the wor words of such people as cardinal winning and that's what i fear the russian the, the Russian Orthodox Church will be issuing statements that these youths will feel justifies their actions, justifies what they're doing, raping and, and uh, capturing um, young people um, and filming them on the internet and posting them on the internet when they're looking for a lover or something like that. And, you know, it's disgraceful. 
You come in there, Sheila. I think you mean. Well, it's just it's astounding that as advanced as we've gotten in technology and medicine and um, you know, space travel, that we're still in a dark age socially when it comes to yeah. interacting with our own kind. Yeah, it's one of the. I mean, after ten years of doing my column in Scott's Gay, which resulted in my first book, which was examining the treatment of sexuality. It was an extraordinary 10 years. It started with the Dunblane Massacre, um, the gunning down of a classroom of children, which was, the, the reporting was very sexualized. You know, they assumed that it, it was this a, a pervert, was he a pedophile and things. And then, then there was various campaigns and it finished on, in, it started in 1995 and it finished in 2005. So it covered, that period covered the repeal of Section 28. And that's, it, yes, it worries me that we've not, we, we, that, we, that we haven't moved on. And that's why after I finished writing up all of this is why I launched and founded the Scottish Secular Society because I really do believe that having done all that research, I've gotten to the, to the root of where much of this comes from, and it is religion. And, and I feel secularism is the answer. Yeah. Um, just say, what have your engagements with the religious community in Scotland been like? <laughs> no, I that's, I'm a great fan of this. <laughs> you serious, Cal? <laughs> no, no, no they, they don't like me. Um, no, 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 it's not fair. I, I have been to a number of churches and had lovely, lovely conversations with individuals. And um, individually, people are, are, are very nice, very sweet, very engaging. And I find it useful. I've been to the Quakers quite recently. You know, lovely people. Um, can't be done with the half an hour silence, but otherwise, <laughs> you know, great, great people. I've been to spiritualist churches. I'm very interested in the history of spiritualism. Um, I, you know, have a lot of empathy with the movement that explored or tried to research it's, uh, it's truthfulness with, in, in the early part of the last century and uh, the women's movement, which was more anti-Christian and the way the Christians have, uh, have tried to control and limit the growth of, of, of spiritualism. And unfortunately, it's now turned into a sort of almost a Christian church, which I think is very unfortunate. So I'm interested in that. And uh, I have gone to, did some research on some churches in Glasgow where I went around to various churches and what I saw disturbed me. And that was, I included that, some of that research in, uh, in, in my book, Religious Fascism. I, I see people have died off. The old yeah. people have died. The lovely old people that made chutney. The old <laughs> preacher that would send money to Africa to help the poor. They've gone, and what's in their place are alpha courses, uh, church planting, aggressive political campaigning. It's much fewer, but they are more aggressive, mm. and these churches aren't pretty. Yeah, I just uh, following on from that. I mean, I think everyone can tell from your accent you're not from Scotland originally. But like no. when you first came up to Scotland, were you quite surprised? Like when you saw what the churches were like up here, like uh, what the Christian lobby is like. Well, going to church was my first port, port of call. I yeah. didn't, I didn't uh, go to church yeah. when I came up here. Um, I, I, I came up here because uh, I had a boyfriend, and I've been up here in Scotland for um, I'm getting on for 15 years now yeah. and I do apologize for my accent as hard as I try I cannot pick it up and I still <laughs> have this horrible uh, when I go down to London you know I still have this horrible Peckham accent and when I go down to London and I start relapsing back into my sort of London accent I'll keep saying things like I, you know, when I'm saying yeah. yes, which I can't help. 
yeah. and people think it sounds ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I belong nowhere. <laughs> yeah, but I think, um, I'm not going back. I love Scotland. Yeah, uh, but I think one that I well, just from my own background was, um, well, your first first time you encountered the wee freeze when you became aware of them and. Just what was your oh, reaction yes. to find out that such people exist? Oh, weird, weird. I was on Harris doing hill walking, and and I we stayed in um, I can't remember it was. I can never remember those long Gaelic names. And I was staying in this kind of uh, bed and breakfast hostel, and it was raining, and there was these people dressed in black, children of and people of all ages walking by dressed in black clutching these Bibles. I thought, my God, there's nothing to do here. And the only thing to do is to go to church. This is really sad. Um, and they did that three times. And they looked so sick and ill. They were mm. outside, outside the church. And I was outside the church. I think I had my yellow jogging bottoms and a bright blue top. And it was Sunday and I was outside the church. And there they all were in black. And I thought, oh, I shouldn't, it's a funeral. And it's, um, and I did, I think the pastor or the minister, he came storming out and he pointed his finger at me and he said, you should be in church. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, oh, you picked the wrong one here. <laughs> <laughs> we had a discussion <laughs> and a little chat. Yeah. Um, just for anyone who's <laughs> unaware of, coming, of what the wee freeze are, it's a uniquely kind of it's unique to the kind of Highlands of Scotland. It's a kind of quite fundamentalist branch of yeah. protestantism um probably most notorious for their absolute obsession with the sabbath um like yes. yeah no transport on no shops chaining up play parks and things like that on the sun on the sabbath they were absolutely obsessed with that. and now it seems to be as we well know their um gay marriage and things like that is now their main obsession yeah um, yeah i know when i was talking to the Minister, I was again my obsession as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, in that, there's a question from the chat room for you, Gary. Have you ever befriended? Yeah, excuse me, I'll say that again. Have you ever befriended any religious leaders, or have you ever heard of any talks between gay rights groups and church leaders? Um. We are presently. Uh, I'm still secretary of the of the Scottish Secular Society, and we are still trying to perform outreach to um, people like the, the Church of Scotland to actually talk to them and see if there is, you know, common ground. Um, I think that's very important, and we've done very well on, as you know, on Secular Scotland, yeah. uh, huge numbers, and the, it's one of the most active pages um in scotland there's yeah. so much debate going on there every day um it's pretty uncensored so a lot of religious people don't like that and won't speak to us because of that um i think they're being a little bit unfair because we don't you know apart from the basic things of no personal insults it's you know it really is for uh discussion and it's not secular scotland is not the scottish secular society that's quite different. That's an organisation that, you know, do, does the campaigning. But Second Scotland is an open open board um, and people can, you know, more or less write what they like. But it's it, there's some lovely contributions from religious people sometimes and they are inspiring. And there's one, um, there's one evangelical lady that I like very much and when she right she's very secular she says look it's a personal thing and i don't impose it on anybody and that to me is much more inspiring than proselytizing i think it's really nice when people have something and it becomes more interesting that way when you're invited in rather than them going out yeah. and you know broadcasting on buchanan street or trying to trying to provoke arrest by 
shouting in loud halos uh, and things like that, which they try to do. Um, that that that's horrible. Um, I don't like that. But yes, I mean, I want to. I want to see more engagement. I could have gone on being angry with all the things that I've seen um, in 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 my ambitions to to you know to see gay people treated equally. I've always wanted um, to find a way over the anger, and secularism is it. It's the compromise. It is the halfway house. It is a place where we can meet. And I want to see religion a little bit more of an effort to engage with us. Um, and we will, we will achieve that. And uh, we have a new chair now, Spencer uh, Faltz, and I think he's going to do a really good job. Yeah. Uh, Caroline did a living great job, but absolutely brilliant. And Spencer is pretty, you know, good at negotiation, negotiating and engaging with religious people. And he's probably a lot better than I, I, I am because people still uh, see me as the angry um, <laughs> gay activist. They have for a long time. <laughs> Let them get on with it. <laughs> yeah. uh, another question has come in there. Yeah, um, do you think Scottish independence will have any effect on the, key, on the cause of gay rights? Hello, Gary? Gary? I think I have lost Gary. Sheila, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, Gary, can you please chime in when you get back? I'm not hearing Gary. Sorry, am I, am I not to speak about... I, 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 I want to say that, that uh, an independent Scotland is, is going to be a, a great place to be gay. I don't, I don't think it's going to have any adverse effects being independent. And um, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Okay. Uh, sorry, um, sorry, Gary, we lost kind of, I think, the first part of your reply there, but I think we got the main point. Oh, sorry. Yeah. All right. Okay. It's all okay. Um, Sheila, I'll go back to you. You've probably got some questions stored up. Yeah. <laughs> um. Actually, uh, not really. He's done a really good job of explaining how, how things are going. Um, do you, as far as um, the, the Scottish Secular Society and, um, you know, gay rights are concerned, do they have anything upcoming that they're going to be, you know, kind of doing uh, kind of down that path, I suppose? Um, what you mean with respect to gay rights and, and things? Yeah. Do you think? yeah. Um, no, not that I'm aware of. Um, the Scottish Secular Society, of course, well, particularly my involvement, has always been solidly behind uh, gay equality uh, and, and gay rights. Um, it has such a close relationship with, with with religion that's been beaten up by religion so much. Why shouldn't it? There are secular societies that don't um, and refuse to have uh, anything to do with it, and we're not one of them. The Scottish Secular Society is very open, and if you, if you probably know on Secular Scotland on Facebook, every day there are um, you know stories of gay inequality connected to religion that are, are you know, published to, to bring people's awareness to the fact that the injustices are still going on. What are the other, uh, do, I mean, do the other organizations state some sort of reason why they don't want to mess with that, or is it just too much of a hot button issue? Um, well, I'm, I'm only thinking of one, which is a very purist um secular group, I don't want to mention names, but they, they distance themselves from it. Um, um, we're, we're not, uh, you know, such a purist secular society. We like to engage, uh, engage secularism um, on all levels. Uh, I want to just, uh, as a, how, how far do you think, has Scotland advanced well in the area of gay rights, do you feel? I mean, or... Do you think they're, Very they're slowly. I mean, don't don't yeah. forget, we it was not um, it was criminal to my goodness, was it nineteen eighty or something or 
So I'm going to get really yeah. past this. I should remember, remember this. I think it was 1985, or it was in the 80s that it was it was still illegal, um, and uh, it it it's um, you know Scotland has been well 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 behind, but we've come a long way. We are becoming a modern nation, and we're becoming, we're growing up pretty fast, um, and that's a good sign. Um. And in what areas do you think Scotland uh, has to work on in the area of gay, on the subject of gay rights? Um, I think I, I think we need to uh, we need to um, um, we need to deal with religion. We need to stop it being so noisy. Uh, it's only a few. It's only a minority, but they're very noisy. And I think we, we we must be louder about secularism. Secularism is unfortunately sidelined in Scotland. An actual fact at the moment, I think that's actually more important than certain aspects of, of gay rights because we more or less have reached now full equality. Gay people are allowed to be married now. So gay people can get married. So even though marriage is not something that I, you know, I think it's a patriarchal institution, I'm not a big fan of it, but I am a fan of equality. And I think it's important that that, that, that uh, we, we have equality. That's absolutely vital. And uh, Scotland really has everything right now. There's very, there's very few minor things that we need to ensure that the transgendered are, are treated equally. There are certain sort of issues that, that, that gay rights organisations are working on and they deserve our support to, to, to reach full equality. Um, but I think one very important aspect of ensuring equality is to deal with religious privilege in Scotland. It must stop. I think secularism is the the one that they're most threatened by because it's the one that threatens their threatens religion specifically, or that they feel threatens religion specifically. You know, it kind of feels like we're attacking their beliefs rather than just trying to make things more fair. Mm, Yeah, exactly, exactly. They're terrified, absolutely terrified. Um, Not all of some religions would be you know happy with secularism can live with it i mean humanism you know lives with 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 secularism and i think, I think um, a lot of religions could learn from that yeah i think buddhists are very accommodating i think they're actively they promote secularism yes, yes i i have traveled to, to to tibet and it was very interesting um looking at the treatment of gay people in, in, in tibet it was a fascinating and fascinating Germany. And when I came back, my article appeared in a gay magazine. And soon after that, the Dalai Lama did make a statement about um, not, I would say, real support for gay rights, but certainly that gay people shouldn't be um, pilloried or bullied or, you know, should, uh, we should treat gay people fairly. Uh, so that, would, that, that, that was encouraging. I think I think secularism religions will eventually come to realize that secularism actually protects them, and that I think they will turn to secularism at the end of the day and realize that they're actually better off with it. So it actually does protect them uh, and their freedom, freedom of religion. It certainly protects them from. Yeah. Um. A question from Apartment G. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to change the question a little bit. I think you said, uh, have you seen like tactics used in other countries for gay rights? Um, and did you employ them yourselves? And if so, what were they? Uh, t- what tactics to... Yeah, to, like to, I said, to... any campaigning or things like that you, that you saw maybe going on in other countries that you, the gay lobby in Scotland have used? And. I, I can't think there'd probably be better people that were more closely involved with yeah. um, Section 28. I, I, I was largely um, monitoring the situation, reading the press, so I was, but, mo- but mostly engaged with that. But at the time during that, I was in America, and I did see um, I did see similar campaigns in California where there were um, propositions that were being campaigned. And, and again, I saw the religious right involved 
And once again, this was pushing me further and further towards uh, get, wanting to get involved with secularism or something to deal with this, because that's nearly always the source of, of political homophobia. It's the church, it's religion, either Islam or Christianity, but it's usually re religion that's the source. Um, seeing that you mentioned Islam, and of course, you know, we've seen quite an influx of, you know, uh, immigrants from, you know, Muslim countries. And it says, has that had any impact on the gay community at all? <sighs> a very interesting question. Yes, it does. Um, it worries me a great deal that uncontrolled immigration, that if there's you know, huge areas are transformed with a lot of immigration. It brings about, obviously, immigration can be good, you know, good for a country. And I'm not against immigration per se, but I'm certainly against, um, you know, uncontrolled immigration because, of course, you're bringing in one particular culture. And if that culture is something like... Um, Pakistan, Poland, Russia, where there really isn't a history of gay tolerance. Yeah. Yes, it's dangerous. It is dangerous, and it's and it's it's detrimental to the hard-won rights of people living here. And you can see that on our streets when you see in schools. I mean, I'm, you know. You know, you see young girls with head scars. I'm not a, 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 against that at all. I think people can wear what they like, and that's. But I want them to understand, and it's not happening in schools. I want them to understand what has come about in this country that has allowed them to wear what they like. I want them to understand. I want them to know the names of those suffragettes who gave their lives for the freedom of women. To, 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 to riled against patriarchy and who fought hard with their lives for freedom and votes for women. And to understand that before they put on those symbols of patriarchy mm. and religion. Um, you guys are actually in a really good area because you get a, a fairly more broad sense of what religion does to people than we do say over here in the States. I mean, you guys have issues with, um, you know, like the, uh, the female genital mutilation is happening. Um, you know, you guys are currently fighting that we don't for the most part have to deal with that sort of stuff over here. Um, and we've got, you know, kind of laws in place to protect it when it does happen. Um, so I, I think, uh, you know, between that and your somewhat forced religion and, and even public schools. And I think you guys have a better idea of, you know, kind of the atrocities that religion can do compared yes. to what we do. Yes. Well, our new vice chair, uh, Ramin Fogani is an ex-Muslim and we have tried to engage with, um, w with uh, the mosques, but uh, no luck so far. <laughs> <laughs> I was also going to say, um, one thing I think I've heard you well mention it on the forums and that is how pers uh, how pervasive is like the American influence in a lot of the you know like I said the opposition to gay marriage because I, I keep hearing that that American evangelicals are infiltrating quite a lot of the churches here. Um, yes, I uh, well with the Section Twenty Eight um, campaign, you know a lot of the money came from the states. Let's make no mistake. Yeah. You know this is. When you see, as I've done here, those buckets go round, I mean, they're not filled with coins, they're filled with notes. Um, the, you know, people throw money at religion without really thinking about where that money is going. And there are, don't, you know, huge congregations in, in America, and those donations go towards the most hideous and abusive um, insults to the human rights of people in Africa and where campaigns are being, uh, are being fought. 
Um, again, at the towards the end of the book, I write about that as well, about the money going from America into uh, Uganda, Nigeria, uh, and how the evangelical broadcasting networks are broadcasting over sub-Saharan Africa. And, and then, of course, you've got the conservative Orthodox churches in Greece, um, in Romania, in Russia, that... Um, and gay people will always be the litmus test for how well a country is doing in the field of human rights. I think it's always worth knowing where gay people are because they are always going to be, you, it's the litmus test. If you know where gay people are, how well they're being treated, you know, you've got a pretty good idea of where human rights stand in, in any one country. Right. Well, and I think, you know, especially when it comes to, um, you know, American churches dumping money into atrocities, you know, kind of funding other religions' atrocities, I think it just makes it easier for them to then convert people, you know, more into Christianity. Like, you know, look, this is what's happening over there. Maybe you should come to us and, and things yes. will be better. Yes. Well, it's the lies. This is it. If they, if they keep... You know, talking about the, you know, promoting the lies, and a lot of what they say is based on lies. Um, there's no one there to refute it. I mean, there was a study. Um, the uh, Renegara study that was read out in the Russian um, Duma, and this was was discredited. Um, by his own peers, and yet is being used to actually shape Section 28 type laws in Russia, and laws that, you know, went on to discuss actually seizing the children of, of, of gay people, taking them off their parents, uh, and things like that. So, you, you know, it has dangerous consequences. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, let's see. I think we've almost... <laughs> I think yeah. we've covered this fairly well. I think we have. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy with that if you guys are. <laughs> uh, we, there's a possibility of a caller. I am speaking to someone to see if they do want to join okay. the call. Cool. Um, yeah, um, I suppose one question I would have, like, um, we've spoken, you know, a lot about, you know, the gay rights law. You say, what can, you know, someone like me, like a heterosexual, what can we do to help you guys? Like, what would you like to uh, see from us? I mean, we kind I'll of have feel like. Apart <laughs> 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 from that. Sorry, I, I'm, being, I'm being flippant. Yeah. Um. <laughs> but in ways of like, because um, sometimes we feel like, oh, we support you, but we don't really know, yeah. you know, how we can actually no, help. Seriously. Yeah. Seriously. Gay, straight people, I always said this, and my friend and colleague Peter Tatchell will say the same. Straight people have been our greatest allies, probably more than gay people. I mean, you know where a lot of gay people are? If they're not dancing in the disco, if they're not uh, signing up to the Catholic Church like Cardinal, um, Cardinal Keith O'Brien, um, if they're not um, being caught with their pants down uh, after, you know, joining some evangelical church, they, you know, th there are so many hypocrites. And, 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 and Gay people are not any less socially conservative than a lot of straight people. So I think looking amongst, looking for allies amongst gay, gay and lesbian people, transgender people is not always the, the best place to look because society is becoming much more diverse now and people are generally much more accepting now we are becoming a lot more liberal than than we ever were and i i the average straight person is our ally definitely um i've had more support from 
straight people than I have a lot of gay people. Uh, you I know, suppose speak to it's gay probably people. safer for straight people to fight for gay rights in some places than it is for gay people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's certainly one of one of the reasons. Gay people are not necessarily very very brave. They're very frightened. They perhaps don't want their parents to know. They don't want their colleagues to know. So they, they live in fear. So it's difficult for them. And I get very frustrated saying, for goodness sake, you know, grow a spine, fight back. And it's very hard for a lot of people. But then when I come across this element of social conservatism, that really frustrates me because I can't deal with that. And I don't like to see that level of hypocrisy that we saw last year with Cardinal Keith O'Brien. You know, he's so vocal against gay sex, and there he is having it. You know, I mean, for goodness sake, have the decency to shut up about it if you're having <laughs> gay sex. I think that's uh, fairly common, isn't it? For the most part, those who protest it the most are the ones that are doing it behind closed doors. I know we find that over here quite a bit. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I... I, I, sex is becoming more diverse. The internet is opening our eyes. We have in, we, we have access now to sex in a lot more a lot more variety of sex. We're actually able to see it, and I think that's changing. Uh, we, we're becoming a lot more freer uh, and a lot more um, able to talk about it more. So. I think that's that's making make, making people perhaps a little bit more honest in the future. I think things people will get a bit more honest about it, a bit more creative about sex, because I see and always have seen sex as an art form, not a science, not a uh, anything other than just something that's a creative force, something wonderful to be celebrated. And it's there for you if you want it. If you don't want it, you don't have to have it. It's simple as that. Uh, I was going to, you, you sort of semi-answered it, but it's, uh, I don't know if it's a cliche maybe or not, but, you know, they say that the ones who rail against gays the most usually turn out to be gay themselves. Have you found that to, there's a grain of truth to that? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, it is true. And there has been done, there has been research done on this in the US, there's been research um, that has proved this to be so. Um you know, it's it, it, it's a fact, yeah. um, and that makes it you know m makes it you know you really are entitled to be suspicious when you see the same men and they're usually men that are so vocal about gay sex in the letters column of newspapers and you read them every day. Um, yes, you are entitled to ask questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to name any. I, I can. No, no. I think <laughs> I know. I know of one person currently who fits that model. But like I say, I don't think it's the place to see on the air. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but um, I'm going to say I uh, wanted to just quickly go on your time as a journalist, like so. You know, I think maybe some people are just like, you know, writing for a, a is it a newspaper or a magazine you write for? Um, well, I don't now. I, don't, yeah. I occasionally freelance, but I don't. I don't um, write write anymore. Um, I uh, I used to illustrate. I did more illustrating than I did writing, yeah. um, and then I did write about sex and sexuality, and mm. and, and of course, uh, gay, gay activism. And, and in Scott's Gay Magazine for 10 years, yeah. like 10 years. And for, um, and, and now two books, uh, yeah. and I enjoy writing about secularism. Yeah. And there's always so much to learn. Yeah. There's all much, there's all, it, it, the Scottish Secular Society is relatively new. Uh, they were wiped out before the First World War in yeah. Scotland. There were many of them, and most of the major major towns had a secular society. Uh, the parents of Keir Hardy would visit the Glasgow one, and they they were wiped out. And so the Scottish Secular Society, coming back, uh, nearly three years old, coming back um, 
Is it three? No, it's, yes, it's more than three years old. Um, coming coming back now yeah. is an interesting um, interesting thing, really, because it's it's coming back at a time when it's most needed, uh, when the privileges, uh, religious privileges, are being handed out left, right, and centre, and there is needed a voice to blow the whistle and to contain religion and to ensure that it's um, you know that it doesn't overstep the mark. Um, and, it, and that it's fair. Yeah. So, you know, so it's a, g- a good time for the Scottish Secular Society. Okay. Um, Sheila, do you have any final questions there? Um, no, actually, I'm, I don't. I think we will wrap Thank up. Thank God, that's very good at answering questions. <laughs> <laughs> you, you did a fairly good job of explaining everything earlier. Yeah. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you. Very yeah. sweet. Thank yeah, you. Say, um, <laughs> uh, thanks for turning out. Like I say, this was kind of a last-minute rush job. Everything seemed to go against me today in trying to get this show together, but we eventually got there in the end. Like I said, I was only 10 minutes in the door before the show started. I had to feed the little fellows you see, you've seen on my shoulder tonight. They needed fed first, and then I had to come on, and then the computer crashed. But I think we got there, and I think uh, we've had a good time with you, Gary. Thanks a lot, and thanks for yeah. enduring all the tech glitches we've had. Cal, one of the other things I write about is offshore radio. A lot of, right. of interest in it. And this is modern day offshore free radio. Yeah. It's kind of free broadcasting. Yeah. It's vital. It's on the edge. It breaks down. It's wonderful. And you do a really good job, Carl. All right. Really good job. Congratulations. Uh, I think that's it. I think I don't know when the next. The, there is, uh, yes, I, I just got this, um, probably Sheila, you'd be new to, but uh, there's not going to be a show on Saturday. I have got guests this weekend, so I'll be unable to do that without, you know, people wandering around in the background talking. So we will reschedule. Who was the guest? I've even forgotten who the guest. Sorry, everyone. I'm, very, I'm in a whirlwind <coughs> in this right now. It's uh, Chris Johnson. He's the author of A Better Life. Um, which interviews uh, various atheists and secularists. So, um, and he just got funded uh, to turn it into kind of a like a video production where he'll actually get to, this, you know, like Richard Dawkins and you know various people in the in the uh, secular movement. So that'll be very cool. Yep, I'm excited um, about that one. And I think Gary will be seeing you again on the fifth of July for the charity show. Oh yeah, because I'm, I'm the, on that. the Scottish Secular Society are penciled in for an hour. Very good. So Excellent. yeah, yeah. Well, like I say there'll be more announcements. The lineup is ninety nine percent there because just as we were about to f- officially announce, someone had to pull out. So we've had to go and rejig the lineup once again. So sorry about that, but there will be a big announcement very soon. We'll have the full lineup forever, and I think it's looking really good who we've got lined up. So, um, again, thank you, everyone, for turning out and tuning in. And if you're listening in podcast land, hope you enjoyed the show. And I see Sheila waving her hand. Have you got something to say there? I just wanted to, you know, do my usual plugs, make sure everybody, uh, you know, kind of make sure everybody tunes into A News. I'm there also every week. Um, We just released a new episode on that today. And, you know, follow me on Twitter. Find me on Facebook. Okay. um, So, Thank you very much, everyone, and we'll see you whenever. Like I say, go down below and you'll find the Facebook and the web page and all that, and we'll have updates soon. On. We'll be back on schedule sh- soon. It's just been a busy few weeks for everyone, so I think we're going to have a good few shows to in the lead-up to the charity show on the 5th of July. So, again, a big thank you to Gary for turning up, and hope it all goes well thank with you. the new book, Gary. Thank you. And hope it all goes well okay. with the new book, Gary. Okay. Okay. And I'm echoing a lot okay. here. Anyway, uh, we'll leave it at that and good night everyone and enjoy the rest of your day.